Hello everyone. Welcome to Groundwater Hydrology and Management, NPTEL course week two, lecture five. Uh, in this week's lectures, we have been looking at understanding the importance of groundwater, both at international scale and at local scale. We also looked at different aspects uh, and drivers of this groundwater extraction, basically crops, industries, etc. We also identify a lot of basins that are more important globally for groundwater management. In the last lecture, we looked at groundwater importance for India, and we'll continue that with some discussions on the South Asia region. Let's take a case study. In this case study by Chanasami et al. 2022, uh, groundwater variations across South Asian regions were analyzed. Uh, as we discussed in the previous lectures, uh, the Asian countries have been known for uh, exporting agricultural products and they are considered to be the food bowl for the other regions also. Basically extracting a lot of groundwater, conducting a lot of agricultural activities and then exporting the product. On this note, eventually the groundwater would be extracted a lot in these regions. So this study looked at a long-term groundwater change from 2002 to 2014 and took into account the major factors that drive this groundwater use. Basically your agriculture, which is represented by the ET. Also temperature and runoff were also looked at uh, to see what are the correlations between that and the groundwater. So this is a average monthly change uh, in the different parameters and you could see that for the South Asian region, uh, the temperature was not changing much, runoff maybe increased uh, slightly during the monsoon period. So the rainfall uh, is on average uh, from May to uh, October and November. Uh, so the peak monsoon was between June and July uh, on average. Um, and also uh, the grace, which is your groundwater was analyzed. So the take home from this slide is that the rainfall can happen and it can peak in suppose July, but the groundwater peaked a month later, which means there is a lag between the time the rainfall occurs and when the groundwater raises up. So it's not like today I'm getting rainfall and tomorrow my wells will be full. It takes time. The same cannot be applied for surface water. Today, today it rains, within a day or two, you will see water in the dams. The dams start to increase uh, eventually, and then within a day or two, and dam, some dams uh, do uh, like urban dams, they uh, fill up uh, as and when the rainfall occurs. But that cannot be said for groundwater. So this is a very important note. In some regions, it takes years uh, for the groundwater signal to show up. So in the South Asia region, on average, the groundwater uh, peaks a month later than the rainfall and uh, stays uh, longer uh, than the rainfall peak. So it, it doesn't die down fast, it slowly dies down. And you can see that the ET, which is your agricultural component, the green line, uh, peaks right in between your uh, two peak month of rainfall and peak month of groundwater. So when the rainfall comes down, still the crop is supported by groundwater. Let's look at the driving factors. So you have all the parameters uh, fit in in this graph, uh, your temperature, uh, your rainfall, runoff, PT uh, on your uh, left axis, your right axis showing, showing the groundwater, all in similar units to be compared millimeters for water and temperature in uh, degrees uh, centigrade. So you do see that uh, the dashed lines, which is groundwater, has been coming down from Jan to Jan 15. So Jan 02 to Jan 015, you see that the groundwater has been decreasing on average. However, your rainfall doesn't show that trend, which means your rainfall is not decreasing. The temperature and runoff are almost the same. It is cyclic and it is almost the same. However, your ET has been increasing. This can be shown by different correlations between the 
two identities by removing all the other variables, just keeping two variables. So we have rainfall and groundwater, and you could see groundwater is declining, rainfall is increasing slightly. So there's no direct impact of rainfall reducing, and that's why groundwater is reducing. So some other factor is there that is pulling out your groundwater. Let's look at now superimposing only the ET, which is your evapotranspiration. Uh, you could see that ET is increasing and your groundwater is decreasing, which means ET is a factor of plant growth. It is a function of uh, plant and uh, agricultural activity. So what this uh, graph uh, clearly uh, shows is that <clears throat> your agricultural activity has increased forest agriculture and all those that uh, evaporates and transpires uh, has increased, whereas that affects your groundwater. So with the same rainfall or almost slightly higher rainfall, you are showing that you are getting more product out and that is only possible if you use another resource, which is groundwater. So across South Asia, uh, all the countries, including the map that we showed earlier, uh, Afghanistan, Iran, Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, uh, Bangladesh, all these countries put together, uh, on average, the groundwater is dec declining and on average, the agricultural productivity is going up. There could be a reason uh, where uh, at one point, it is almost balancing each other. Your ET was balancing the groundwater use. However, after that, it becomes unsustainable. If you keep on extracting groundwater, if this uh, curve goes on declining, then eventually you will run out of groundwater. So this is a warning to the system that uh, the rainfall has not changed. If you look at the rainfall, it doesn't change much. Okay, peaks are around 200 uh, and uh, the uh, thickness or the length of the monsoon has not totally diminished or changed much. However, even though you have good rainfall, uh, to be honest, it has been increasing. You could see that it has been an increasing trend. Uh, however, uh, the groundwater is declining. Okay, the slope of the groundwater is around uh, minus 0.0212. So uh, this is a very important find according to the study that uh, even though your rainfall is increasing, which is a source of your groundwater recharge, your groundwater is still going down. It then, and that can be explained only by the fact that the agricultural uh, use of water has been increasing because your agricultural ET has increased. So moving on, uh, this, these are the studies that we discuss about uh, groundwater issues and concerns uh, in Asia. Um, and we also looked at uh, countries such as India, which export uh, a lot of this groundwater virtually, uh, and also they grow a lot of crops. And because of that, uh, groundwater quantity in India uh, is the highest uh, that has been extracted in the world, um, followed by US and China. And that is one of the reasons I brought into this picture the most predominant South Asian countries. Um, and if we understand this, most of the other regions could be understood that if you uh, target uh, groundwater uh, rejuvenation or management, you need to target the key variables that are causing the groundwater to decline. And in this case, it is the agricultural activities. So how do you reduce it is the question or how do you change it? And which would be, we will be looking at uh, in detail in some of the lectures. Moving on, uh, we also saw that uh, we have um, other issues in, in understanding other issues of groundwater, which means uh, not only quantity, but groundwater quality is also a concern. And let's take a quick look at what are the key issues in groundwater quality in India. So I'm not going to uh, discuss uh, a lot. I'll tell you why, because that is beyond the scope of this course. Um, let's take, for example, groundwater quality uh, has been mapped uh, by uh, Pulkarni and Vijay Shankar 2014 uh, using the CGWB data from 2006 and 2010. What we find is uh, the number of uh, water quality issues um, uh, district-wise uh, in this map 
um, and uh, what are the difference? What are the difference uh, in between the districts? Are they having multiple issues or one, two issues? So if you could see uh, the coloring, uh, one uh, is represented by dash lines and two in uh, dotted lines and three in boxed lines. You can see that most of the regions have in this side have dotted lines. Uh, indicating that they have two issues, two uh, groundwater quality issues. Um, and they've mapped that along with stage of groundwater development uh, and show that uh, the groundwater has been uh, uh, declining in the regions where the groundwater quality is bad. If you look at these regions, uh, already it has two issues. It could be EC, fluoride or arsenic, any combination. Um, uh, and also the groundwater level is declining, overexploited. So as and when you decline uh, your groundwater level or you or take more and more groundwater without recharging it, your water quality is going to get bad. And these are the natural contaminants. It is not a pollutant which is introduced by industry. It is a natural contaminant. In other words, uh, these occur naturally and it's very hard to control this. The only way is to not use such uh, high groundwater volumes in these areas. Okay, so the study uh, tries to uh, indicate that um, uh, the uh, box lines uh, uh, where all the three uh, issues happen, EC, fluoride and arsenic are very less, uh, but mostly it is one issue or two issues and these two issues are also coinciding with Overexploited regions. So the study uh, also says that the limits um, have been breached in most of these regions. So if you drink this water with EC fluoride and arsenic, you're actually uh, uh, spoiling your health. Okay, so there's a lot of health implications in drinking these uh, polluted water. All are natural uh, contaminants. Moving on, uh, another study by Podgorsky et al. in 2020 has mapped. Uh, the uh, groundwater quality concerns and also natural factors, for example, the geologic content uh, across India. So what they find is the greater the arsenic in groundwater um, uh, are found in regions where we have uh, unconsolidated sediments uh, along with some basic volcanics. So here we have some uh, arsenic, but uh, it's, it's very less, the blue color is very less. Uh, however, if you look at the Ganges Basin, uh, along the sediment area and uh, the young Himalayan mountain range area, you do find a lot of arsenic contamination. The arsenic contamination could be transported also, but mostly uh, these are groundwater well data. So when they take well data and look at it, uh, it is along the Ganges, which is an Indus Basin, which is really, really concerning. So I'd like to take a, a pause here, because uh, as we have seen, uh, if we start to discuss the groundwater issues uh, in terms of quality, uh, that will take a long time. Uh, and that focus is not part of this course. This is groundwater management course, yes. Uh, it is my duty to ensure that everyone knows that there is a groundwater quantity issue and a quality issue. So here, if you go to the Ganges, there's a lot of groundwater. Groundwater is abundant, but is the water quality good? So it is the same as saying no groundwater. So if I'm going to make a map and I have groundwater map uh, for a particular village for domestic and agricultural use, I have to disclose that the water is available or not. and is the quality good for consumption or not? Otherwise, I should plainly write the, the water is not available because there's no point in having bad groundwater uh, and claiming that groundwater is there. It is kind of misleading, okay? So for the use, which is uh, predominantly domestic and uh, uh, agricultural use, the quality is a very, very important factor. If you go to <clears throat> the Gujarat regions, uh, some of the water has saline properties, I have a lot of salt content uh, due to ingression and also uh, infiltration along the sea. So uh, is that water useful for growing crops? It is not. So we cannot promote agriculture there, claiming that the groundwater is available because the groundwater quality is not correct. 
or not uh, up to standards. So uh, it is very important to have both groundwater quantity and quality to sustain good groundwater use, including your recharge uh, networks have to be in line uh, for domestic and uh, agricultural use. Industry is a different um, factor. Uh, they might use it very, very differently. For example, a thermal power plant might use groundwater for cooling. Uh, they won't cons cons care more about the quality of the water uh, and if an industry use it for washing maybe they don't care much about the quality however uh, for agriculture and for domestic use it is very important to have uh, groundwater quantity and quality addressed okay so uh, make sure this is very clear uh, in terms of uh, understanding groundwater quantity and quality is important However, for this course, for this particular course, uh, many issues and concerns on groundwater quality exist, including industrial pollution, anthropogenic pollution, when, when human sewage is mixed in groundwater. All these issues are there, but that will be a course by itself. So that could be a groundwater quality course, not a quantity course. In this course, we will only focus on groundwater quantity <clears throat> the methods will only focus on groundwater quantity uh, and maybe in the future there will be a groundwater quality course. So the, it is beyond this course, so uh, kindly excuse that part. There's a lot of materials available uh, for uh, self-learning on groundwater qualities. Some chemistry background would be uh, beneficial, uh, but not necessary uh, to understand everything on groundwater quality. So from now on, we would only focus on the groundwater quantity issues, volume, uh, how much is there, why is it there, and how can we improve it. If you see the case studies also, I was careful to pick case studies only on groundwater quantity, uh, both internationally and nationally. Uh, but nationally, I also had to uh, showcase this in, the, in this uh, lecture so that you understand it is not only quantity, but quality also. So moving on, let's do a recap of uh, week two. Uh, what we started with is by quantifying the different water sources uh, in the world. Uh, so of the 100% water, 97.5% uh, per FAO is locked in your oceans, seas, and saline water bodies. Only 2.5% of that is freshwater. Uh, and of the freshwater, 80% is uh, locked in the ice caps and glaciers. We discussed that in uh, the mountain regions, it is very hard to take a mountain water and then say, I'm going to have fresh water because uh, the distance and transportation is not going to work. So of the fresh water, the easily and locally available is your groundwater, which is around 20%. Uh, and of that, uh, other 1% of fresh water is in lakes, soil moisture, uh, rivers, streams, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So even though you visualize lakes and rivers are, are being big water bodies, uh, it is not as uh, big as the groundwater. So the readily available and easily available resource is groundwater for freshwater, uh, and because of that, it has been widely used across nations. This widely used uh, uh, attitude for groundwater has caused its decline. A lot of groundwater issues have happened. So in this week, what did we do? We looked at the importance of groundwater by establishing these water budgets, uh, how much water is available, how much of that is saline um, and locked in ice caps, uh, and how much of that is groundwater. More importantly, when you talk about lakes and rivers and uh, streams, uh, someone have to be very close to these water bodies to access the water. However, groundwater is more or less distributed. So if you take a village uh, and a river flowing, um, only those who are near the river can access the surface water, which is the river water for agriculture. Uh, but everyone can do a pump uh, and uh, extract the groundwater, which could be recharged by your surface water, which is your rivers and streams. And rainfall also occurs. So you, locally also you can recharge. So groundwater is a very, very uh, important tool for uh, equitable share of water uh, and it promotes a lot of farming in small scale farming because a small scale farmer may not have 
the con connection to a surface water body or a dam. But still, uh, they can take a groundwater uh, well or uh, share wells between two, three farmers and then use it for agriculture. Uh, we also looked at groundwater used by major nations. Uh, we looked at uh, even developed countries such as Australia, uh, India and China suffering uh, from uh, major groundwater abstraction. Uh, we looked at groundwater footprints and understood that of the major basins, almost three to four times area is needed to sustain the groundwater use, the current groundwater use. Uh, it is not sustainable. So it is very important to uh, make sure that the groundwater extraction is sustainable. Otherwise, all the uses that are currently going on will have to stop. So we looked at footprint, uh, the area required to sustain these activities. And that gave way to a lot of groundwater concerns, uh, where water can be recharged, uh, how much water is extracted, is it above or beyond the annual recharge, etc. So we visualized a, a bank unit uh, and your salary is the water that is coming in. If you keep on taking water more than your incoming, then you will have uh, been eating on your savings. You will be taking water from the past uh, and so it is not sustainable. So because your future needs water, right? So you need to leave water behind. Uh, and uh, the, those groundwater concerns we looked at. Once uh, these general groundwater concerns we looked at and footprints, we looked at the international groundwater basins. Uh, very importantly, we looked at the major basins uh, in uh, India, China, uh, and Middle East countries, uh, Australia, etc. We found that one third are under stress. So uh, a good percentage, 30 percent of them uh, and above have groundwater issues uh, and it doesn't stop in only Asia, but also in developed nations such as US and China, Australia. We also identified uh, through a study uh, that major crops uh, uh, which are grown in these groundwater uh, extensive used basins. Uh, and we found that rice, wheat, sugarcane are the key crops uh, that continuously extract a lot of water, uh, which is uh, unsustainable. So uh, these major crops have had an impact on the uh, groundwater use. Uh, and most of the time, it is not uh, a very uh, wise use of groundwater because most of the crops are exported for a very low price. Uh, and uh, the uh, groundwater is also exported along with the product. So uh, there is a big necessary uh, point to change the attitude of groundwater use, uh, to change the crops that are uh, irrigated by groundwater so as to sustain groundwater for longer term. Uh, then we focused on the Indian groundwater importance. Uh, why India is because, uh, yes, this course is uh, conducted in India, but more importantly, India is the largest groundwater extractor at around 262 to 65 kilometer cube per year. Uh, and this is much bigger than uh, the second ranked nation, which is US uh, and China even put together. So uh, we have to start uh, uh, reassessing the uh, importance of groundwater in India and also understand the physical processes that drive groundwater uh, recharge so that we can manage it properly. We also looked at block estimations. Uh, so how the Central Water Board divides Indian uh, states into blocks and districts and each block and district, uh, they take groundwater values for once in four months. Uh, and then they establish these uh, indexes, uh, basically to say if the groundwater level uh, is okay, critical or semi-critical. And uh, if it is safe, then it means that the groundwater can be further used. Um, but if it is uh, critical and semi-critical, then we need to have concerns. Uh, we need to properly manage groundwater. If it is over-exploited, which means groundwater use is above the 
uh, groundwater recharge. So if I'm putting 100 rupees, if I take 110 out, 110 rupees out, that means it's over exploitation. So uh, if that happens, then the idea is that we are using groundwater from the past um, and that uh, we uh, looked at some images to show that it happens a lot in northern India and central India, including Karnataka, Andhra, Tamil Nadu, uh, and along the north uh, west, we had Rajasthan, Haryana, Punjab, uh, all exploiting groundwater uh, more than the annual recharge. Uh, in this today's lecture, we also looked at the groundwater quantity versus quality. Uh, we made sure that uh, it is important to study both the quantity and quality for groundwater management. Uh, especially, we looked at some natural contaminants, which included EC, arsenic, and fluoride. Uh, these uh, contaminants are present or, or driven by the geologic setting. Okay, so we, we looked at a study which showed these uh, different um, groundwater quality concerns across India and how the groundwater level uh, correlates with these uh, groundwater quality. Uh, it was found that uh, uh, it is very important to understand both these important uh, factors for groundwater, groundwater quantity and quality. However, uh, just for the course uh, structure and the course progress, we will only focus on groundwater quantity issues, methods, and what are the forward steps for groundwater quantity uh, conservation. Uh, the quality will follow as a separate course. Uh, with this, uh, I think we have covered the major important uh, part of the uh, lectures. Uh, and uh, from week three onwards, we will look at the physical hydrology, the different components that explain the groundwater uh, pattern. Uh, and then we will follow into some um, research and teaching on uh, case studies in India uh, and also groundwater uh, monitoring, monitoring by different agencies. Um, uh, then we will also look into models which actually collect all this data and create uh, databases or results uh, to better manage groundwater situation. With this, uh, I would like to stop uh, for today and I will see you in week three courses of uh, NPTEL groundwater resource management. Thank you.